back on. Um, you can feel free. Let me set this mic back up. What's happening to me, Greg? Sit in or you want to take a break? Uh, just let these guys go, okay? I'll get a little closer. You could go ahead. You're live on KPFA's um, video channel. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody here in uh, in broadcast land. Everybody who's checking out KPFA.org. Uh, my name is Andres Soto, and I'm the host of the show de Andres Soto every Thursday at 3:30 p.m. till 4 p.m. And uh, I have here as my first guest. Cat uh, Black, who's with Venetians for a Safe and Healthy Community. Uh, welcome to the live broadcast today, Cat. Thank you, Andres. Uh, go ahead and don't, don't be afraid to get too close to the mic. Okay. And so, um, you know, we're here at this mass mobilization. We just marched from um, uh, Oscar Grant Plaza over here to the Lake Merritt Amphitheater. And uh, so you were part of the contingent. We were both part of the contingent uh, from Venetia where we have this group, Venetians, for a safe and healthy community. Tell us what's going on in Venetia. Tell, tell us the history of the Valero Project and, and what Venetians for a safe and healthy community are doing. Valero is a refinery that's in Venetia, California, and it is proposing to bring in 50, uh, two 50-car trains per day uh, of fracked and tar sands oil. Um, that's 100 cars in and 100 cars out per day. Bakken, Bakken and, and, Bakken and Frack and tar sands from all, all from North America. And um, they're, they're, they have to go through a use permit application with the city. And currently it's before the Venetia, uh, the Venetia Planning Commission. Uh, they released a draft environmental impact report last year. And... Uh, we just heard back, there was a long public comment period, we just heard back from the city saying that parts of the DEIR are so flawed that they have to completely start from scratch and recirculate it. So we've been able to stave off uh, this project for two years. Now, isn't it also true that they uh, were trying to jam this thing through first with a mitigated negative declaration? They didn't even want to have any fire until Venetians for a safe that's correct, and uh, really the, the citizens, and not just Venetians for Safe and Healthy Community, but other organizations, we you know all formed and got together, and uh, they were forced to have to do the complete environmental impact review through CEQA, and you know obviously this does have a uh, harsh impact on the, on the environment and the community, so it's it's just not safe. So help has been provided by uh, NRDC, Natural Resources Defense Council, Force Ethics, uh, as well as uh, Communities for a Better Environment and other groups. Uh, many groups have uh, weighed in. The local, the, the local refinery towns all have uh, the city of Davis, um, SACOG, the... Uh, Sacramento Council of Governments. Right. Uh -huh. they, they chimed in. The Attorney General... County, Willow County, Morrison. Right. Um, uh, even, even UC Davis, because uh, the trains would be going right past their, uh, their dormitories. So there have been many, many uh, organizations and agencies and uh, government agencies that, that have chimed in and showing that this is just really unsafe, not just for our city, but for all of the towns that come around that you know, really end game and it really should be our city that's, that's questioning all of this, like all of the other cities before us. And uh, it's, it's kind of disheartening that they can't see how horrible this is. Now, most people, when they think about the town of Venetia, they think of a nice, quaint little town, a town uh, that is uh, very idyllic, but yet, you know, a quarter of its city's budget comes from the Valero refinery. And what has that done to the politics? 
politics in Benicia. How would you describe the politics in Benicia as it relates to the American fine work? Once again, we're talking Cat Black from uh, Benicia's first city. It's been very difficult because uh, there's a good, good portion of people in Benicia that believe that Bolero is their cash cow. And um, we've actually heard the words from the proponents of this where they say they don't want it to turn into Vallejo, which is just a really harsh thing to say and is very classist, racist, 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 racist classist. classist. And, you know, so you have some very fervent um, belief that Valero is telling us the truth, that they're, you know, a good neighbor and you know, they, they can see beyond the money and all of it. Anytime you have any of the people that are that come up in favor of this, that go before the planning commission, it's always about the money, the money, the money, the money. And I don't, I, I'm not letting my town be full. That sounds like a great uh, movement that's going on there, Manisha. Thank you so much for your work. Kat Black, uh, steering committee uh, chair of Manisha's for a safe and healthy community. And I see right over here our friend Ethan. And, uh, Thank you, Andres. So, yeah, from Forest Ethics. Ethan Buckner, how you doing, Holmes? I'm doing awesome. Hey, why don't you take Kat's seat? Is this uh, Hey, everybody. Yeah, so, so, why don't you slide over here in the cat seat? And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have here Ethan Buckner, who is uh, organizer with um, Forest Ethics. And uh, so Ethan, welcome here to kpfa.org. And uh, tell us about your work in helping to organize this event today and some of your impressions. Well, and speak right into the mic real close. Well, thanks so much for having me, Andres. Uh, it's a beautiful day today. We were blessed with a little bit of sunshine. Uh, in between the much needed rain and it's wonderful that uh, so many folks turned out uh, for the March for Real Climate Leadership. Well, folks are coming from all over California before uh, uh, just a couple weeks ago uh, was part of this tour called the California Crossroads Tour. We went to seven different cities, eight different cities across California with hundreds of uh, folks who are organizing to uh, transition our, our uh, society away from fossil fuels, to stop fracking, to fight oil by rail, and to build uh, clean energy solutions. And a lot of those folks are here today, and we're seeing thousands of folks from across the state converge uh, to demand that Jerry Brown really uh, put his, uh, his uh, walk where his talk is on climate, because we know that climate leaders can't uh, keep developing fossil fuel infrastructure while at the same time trying to promote themselves as a climate leader. So, Ethan, in your travels up and down California uh, and meeting all these uh, group of people who have been getting involved in the movement, what seems to be the thing that unifies them? What, what seems to be the thing that's motivating them to come together to do actions like this? Well, uh, you know, folks get involved for a number of different reasons. If folks are uh, worried about public health, the effects of fracking or the oil trains, uh, or safety from the trains rolling through their communities, or the risk of contamination from a spill, or you know, folks who are worried about uh, the impacts of climate change. Uh, but really, uh, above all, people are coming together because uh, we know that uh, people power is what's building this movement, and that folks have the power within their communities and as a community of Californians to uh, to really transition our communities together. And so feeling the power of people coming together is, I think, what's motivating a lot of folks to be here. Well, you know, uh, the environmental justice movement, the environmental movement is a mature movement here in the United States. It's a mature hey! movement here in California. And uh, yet this uh, fracking uh, aspect of it, the crude by rail aspect of it, is a relatively new phenomenon. And uh, we've seen Jerry Brown get challenged in a number of places, from the Democratic Convention to public speaking engagements. Um, has it had impact on Jerry Brown? Is he changing his tune at all? Or do people really need to ramp it up and, in fact, threaten him? Well, you know, Jerry Brown, uh, my take on Jerry Brown is that he's going to He's going to do the right thing eventually, um, because he's we're not going to leave him alone until he does. You know, he uh, likes to retort. I think at the convention, 
he asked all the activists, oh, well, did you uh, drive your cars here? Did you walk to Sacramento? Well, like we the oil that, industry folks uh, say. Yeah, it was a line straight from Big Oil. And you know, when you have a governor that accepts hundreds of thousands of dollars from Big Oil, you can expect that type of uh, language to come out of his mouth. But we know that Jared Brown cares about his legacy. We know that he's trying to paint himself as uh, doing more than any other governor. Uh, on climate, and when we saw Andrew Cuomo in New York State, just take a look at the science and listen to his uh, head of the Department of Health, who said, "I don't want my two-year-old kid living near a fracking well, and therefore no." Uh, as well as the organizing. Exactly, and, and and that you know, and, and Andrew Cuomo had to respond to a very powerful movement. We are lucky here today to have been joined from by activists from across the state of New York, who uh, helped make. Uh, the ban on fracking real in New York State. So we see this similar kind of movement building here. And, you know, Jerry Brown's not going to have a choice. Uh, if he wants his legacy to be one of the climate leadership, he's going to have to step up and listen to the science and ban fracking. Instead of uh, playing music yeah. while the Titanic is sinking. Exactly. All right. Well, Ethan Buckner from uh, Forest okay. Ethics, one of the leaders of this movement, thank you so much. Thanks so much, John, guys. Here, brother. All right. Okay. okay. Next, we have Charlie Davison who's uh, associated with CRUDE, uh, which is Crockett Rodeo United to Defend the Environment. And uh, why don't you put some headphones on so you can hear what we're saying and speak right into the mic uh, real close so that everybody can hear what you got to say. So uh, welcome, Charlie Davidson. Hi, I'm Grace. Uh, I'm also with the Sunflower Alliance and the 350 Bay. Right on. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what's going on with the Philip 66 project that last week got the green light uh, from the Contra Costa County Board of Supervisors over community objections, basically serving, uh, you know, uh, the interest of industry over there. What is the problem with the problems with the Philip 66 project over there in Rodeo, as well as the connection to Santa Maria? Well, the, the Santa Maria refinery and the Philip 66 refinery in Rodeo, they're 200 miles apart, and they're actually connected by a 200-mile pipeline. They're really one refinery called the San Francisco Refinery, and each of the refineries have had separate projects, and they've described them in their environmental impact reports if it, as if they're two separate projects, but in reality, they're one project. The, uh, they've never really divulged the true, or publicly divulged, I should say, the true intention of the Philip 66 uh, Rodeo project called the Propane Recovery Project uh, as being a tar sands project. But the uh, Santa Maria Refinery, their rail spur extension project, uh, when their first report came out, they refused to say exactly what kind of crude was coming in by their uh, daily 100 car trains. But uh, in their second recirculated environmental impact report, they actually finally admitted that it, it was not back and crude. And the only kind of train that comes to California in 100 car trains is either back and crude or tar sand. So by not being back and crude, it's uh, by default is going to be tar sands, and that will be partially refined in Santa Maria and sent up to Rodeo in their 200-mile pipeline. So, in fact, both projects are now, we know, are tar sands projects, and already the Rodeo refinery, it's a medium-sized refinery, it's half the size of Chevron, but it's the most dirtiest, it's the dirtiest refinery in California. It's half the size of Chevron in Richmond, but emits 50% more uh, polluting toxins. So, um, tell the folks at KPFA the route that the trains would take if the Phillips project down in Santa Maria actually gets passed. What, where will they bring these uh, 100 car unit trains filled with this dangerous Bakken, or in this case, tar sands crew? What would be the, the route for those trains? Well, uh, well, firstly, uh, tar sands is actually not really crude oil as we know it. It's bitumen, it's solid, it has to be it's diluted. Tar. It's, it's like tar. tar, it's like asphalt, and it ha it's solid unless it's diluted with uh, at least 30% solvent. So these train cars are with the most polluting uh, crude or bitumen that you could ever imagine that's ever been going through any refinery. And that, that's going to be converted into uh, gasoline. It takes a lot of energy to do that, a lot more than normally. A so, lot more water. And a lot more water. And so this bitumen, it's going to be coming from the Feather River Canyon, which is a, a, a crucial in terms of San Francisco's water supply. And across the delta, 
through all the Bay Area urban communities, such as uh, Berkeley, uh, Oakland, right through Jack London Square. It'll be going right by Yoshi's window by about uh, 15 feet away in these mile-long trains. Uh, that will be taking, I don't know, forever and a day to get through the city there. And uh, going all the way down the coast, uh, over numerous canyons and, and rivers, all the way to Santa Maria. So it's crucial, and it'll be going over areas that affect almost half of California's water supply. Now, at the uh, Contra Costa Board of Supervisors, when they approved the uh, Phillips 66 project in Rodeo last week, um, clearly arguments were made that shows that there was all kind of violations of the CEQA process in that approval. Where do you think uh, this project was going to go next? I'm not sure. Uh, it was uh, one of the first things that they mentioned being two separate projects, but describing it. Uh, Which is illegal piecemealing under CEQA. Exactly. They described it as two separate projects, but it's really one project. So it's illegal under the California Environmental Quality Act. The Board of Supervisors greenlighted it with basically no discussion. They did not want to have a discussion. There was no acknowledgement that the original uh, draft EIR and the recirculated draft environmental impact report were uh, qualitatively different and the intentions became obvious that they didn't want to have anything to do with any 